Okay, so today what we're going to be looking at is um, protected areas and, you know, national parks, so, you know, wildlife protected areas, they fall under different names depending on where they are in the world. Um, and I'm going to be going through some criteria that you'll need to be able to use when you're evaluating a protected area or designing a protected area. Um, and so if you were to put in charge of designing a protected area, say here in the Czech Republic, you could pick a place and you could think about all these things to make it the most successful you can to be, to be able to benefit biodiversity, but also meet the needs of the people in the surrounding area. Um, I'm going to go back and forth with an example of Yellowstone National Park in the U.S., um, but you're going to be creating your own area and you'll also evaluate another one in the next class. Okay, so the first thing is that you need to think about is the size, shape, um, the is it fragmented, are there roads, are there co corridors, things like that. So if you're looking at an air, a protected area, you want to think about what is its actual shape? Uh, because you want to try to minimize um, the edge effect as much as possible. So let me go to this picture real quick. So here's um, Yellowstone National Park, and there's actually another national park nearby. And looking at the one of the one very important thing is the bigger the protected area you have, the better. Just because certain organisms might have a really big range and they need a lot of space to be protected, whether it's a big grizzly bear or whether it's a jaguar, whether it's a panda. So the larger it is, the larger the protected area, the better. Just there's more resources, there's more productivity, and it could just support more biodiversity. Um, but also in the shape, one thing you have to be wary of are the edges because the edges here, they can, if, if it's bordering up against, you know, a city or an inhabited area, it might make, you know, it's, it's going to be the most vulnerable around the edges, right? The middle of the park should be fairly safe for organisms. But as you're around the edges um, that aren't going to be protected as well, um, you would want to try to keep the shape to have as few veggies as possible. So, you know, it's this surface area to volume ratio, right? You don't want as much surface, you want to keep as little surface area as possible contact with the outside world. So one really long, thin one might not be as effective. However, it also depends on the park that you're looking at. If you want a national park that's literally just going to be protecting the Yellowstone River and this riparian area, it might be long and skinny. Um, but if you can make a another one, maybe we're just around this whole area, that would be even better. So the bigger, the better. Fewer boundaries with human inhabitants are better as well. Um, and then some other things you have to think about with those fragmentations is, are, you, are there roads going through here? Because what can happen is if it's fragmented, so we've got one, one park here and one park here, and they're separated. So how would a bear from here get to this one. So how would one get from Grand Teton to Yellowstone? If there's roads through here, that might be difficult. Or if there's roads through the, through the park, they might not be able to get from one section to another. So if it's fragmented, that can keep populations separate from each other and it keeps them from interbreeding and it reduces the genetic diversity within those smaller populations. Um, and But if you do have to have two separate parks. You want to try to create corridors between them. So if we've got these two parks here and they were to build up a nice corridor area that was protected for the organisms, they still might be able to migrate between the two areas as best they can. Okay, um, so shape, fewer edges, size, big is better. Fragmentation factors. You don't want it to be fragmented if you can help it. Um, if you do have roads, you want to make sure that you protect, you make um, corridors over or under those roads, like pipes underneath or bridges over the top, um, or corridors between two parts of the park that somehow can't, you know, they can't get to other ways. So corridors are important. All right, uh, the location in a country. So you you need to think about what is the surrounding um, land use area and the distance from urban centers. If it's really close to an urban center, I mean, there's benefits to that because people can get out to nature and appreciate it and maybe they'll learn and want to protect it more. But it also makes it more vulnerable the more people that are, could be around it. Um, they might want to come in and log some trees or poach some animals. Um, so that has to really be considered. 
Um, and you can see this Yellowstone National Park is actually pretty well way out in the middle of nowhere. Um, but you can see here in Costa Rica, there's lots of different reserves. And, you know, these reserves can end up being near some of the larger cities. But what you do see is some of that surrounding area that they have is called a buffer zone. And these buffer zones generally will be areas that don't allow necessarily full settlements or have some restrictions into logging and other things like that. Um, so it's it's like a buffer. So let's say there's a city right here. There's all this buffer area where maybe the, there's a forest for some mixed use, um, but it's not quite as inhabited as maybe the city areas would be. So having buffer zones around those parks can be a nice touch as well. The source of funding. Um, if you can get governmental sources of funding for most countries and that it can be the most steady source of income because it can be more guaranteed from year to year. But it does have to have taxpayer support, you know, and, and voters because they could say, oh, well, we don't want to be paying for that. But generally, governmental funding can be a little bit more steady and reliable than private funding. So private funding, if the donor, you know, if they pass away and their children or whoever inherited their 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 money might not want to continue, uh, it could be a foundation that can change hands and people can make decisions. So, you know, the one nice thing about non-governmental organizations is they can be pretty agile, like we learned in the last um, in the last lesson, uh, whereas governmental organizations tend to be a little bit slow and it's harder to change things. So having that government funding can sometimes make it a little bit more consistent, more reliable. However, getting extra money from um, private donors is also a benefit as long as you know they can put it to, to use for a number of different things. So maybe having a combination, like have some core funding from the government and then have supplemental funding and ways for people to donate can, can add to, to the different programs. Um, management programs. This is how are you managing the park? Are there rangers that are protecting the animals there? You know, in some of the national parks in Africa, they have people walking around protecting the rhinos or the elephants. Um, oh, I skipped over education. I'll come back to that. But the man um, other management programs could be if there's particular species that need some extra help, like you've got to put some food out for them uh, because the, there's not quite enough room or resources for them to survive. So that funding is going to end up paying for a lot of these management things. How are, are you controlling how many people can come into the park? Are you regulating what types of uses can happen? Can people camp there? Can they, you know, how... Uh, can they drive off the road or what are the trails like? Are people taking care of those things? So you need to be able to manage those parks. Um, so you're thinking about managing the people, keeping them out or allowing them in, in which ways, um, but you're also taking care of the organisms that live there if there's any species that need some special protection. Um, so those can be important. In Yellowstone, uh, they, they ended up reintroducing the wolves to Yellowstone National Park, and that was an active management plan. So, you know, that was something there weren't wolves that lived there before. And then they decided, oh, this was part of their range. This could be a good place because they were natural predators there. And so they decided uh, for an active management plan to reintroduce wolves. And it was actually quite successful. Education programs. Education programs are often kind of tied also to community support because if you have education programs there, um, often affiliations with schools or universities um, that that teach people, you know, what are the benefits of the park, what are what are the important things that need to happen to take care of the park, that can assure some more long term commitment um, by the community living there by possible universities for funding and people um, doing research there. And that's bringing me to the community support and, and proper research. Proper research, if you have universities that are coming in and doing research, monitoring the population. So when they reintroduced the wolves, there was a number of different um, studies going on to see how, how did the deer populations change? How did, um, you know, how are the wolves? Are they staying within the park? Are they, you know, so they, Having that proper research tends to help maintain the biodiversity in the park. It makes it safer for the organisms, safer for any people that might be visiting there. Um, and they're also aware of, oh, if there's any changes that happen, maybe a fire went through, how is that impacting and what needs to be done to help maintain that biodiversity. And community support is imperative because if the, the surrounding community is not 
doesn't have buy-in to that park, then they're going to be breaking laws. They're going to probably be doing things to help, you know, that could end up hurting the biodiversity in that park. One really big deal when they reintroduce the wolves to Yellowstone is in the surrounding um, towns and, and well, you know, the smaller towns, there, there's a lot of farmland here and people own a lot of cattle and they're really upset, cattle and sheep saying, oh, these wolves are gonna come in and they're gonna kill all of our sheep. So they had to make sure they got community support in for that. Um, what were they gonna do if the wolves did leave the park and come and kill one of the sheep? Um, and they, you know, there's, there was programs that they had to reimburse the farmers because if they weren't and the farmers are upset about it, if, a, if they see a wolf, they're going to shoot it. So if you don't have that community support, then um, it can make things difficult. Another way you can get community support and actually help with funding is if the community members are starting to make money off of the tour, like ecotourism in the park. And so trying to let them know that there are benefits to having this wildlife pr preserve and getting them involved and hiring them locals for um, giving tours or you know the development of um, places for people to stay however that might work restaurants and other things around that's all kind of focused around the park so that can help also garner community support because people are getting jobs and, and getting are and are more employed Lastly, one thing to kind of consider sometimes is high profile animals to parks. Like if you have um, a panda bear in your park, then more people are going to want to come there to see it and look after it. More people are going to donate money because they can act like these umbrella species that we looked at last time. So these high profile animals um, can can kind of jazz up the park and help um, help get funding, help get a little bit more support and bring in maybe possibly more tourism. But the tourism, again, you've got to like really think about the tourism because you don't want to necessarily have too much of it. Otherwise, that's going to impact the biodiversity. So there's all of these crazy things that you have to think about when you're um, when you're evaluating a park, when you are designing a park. And that's what your next task is going to be is to design your own park somewhere in the world.